Let's read one more time the text this morning, Acts 19, verses 19 and 20. And we could really include verse 18 in, in there as well. I'll read that as well. Let's read verses 18 through 20 from Acts 19. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Beloved saints of God, there comes a time in everybody's life when he or she must sort through all their possessions. Uh, perhaps that time is when uh, a young adult moves out of the home for the first time. Perhaps a family moves house and now they have to organize all their belongings or even in uh, once a year, perhaps we subject our houses to a thorough cleaning. But when we sort through all our possessions, we put them always into one of three categories. In the first place, we put our possessions in the category of the things that we are going to keep. In the second place, we put those things into a category of uh, those things that we are either going to throw away or destroy. Or in the third place, we put some of our possessions in a in a bin that we are going to, to sell or to give away. Now, if you or I ever become convinced by the Spirit of God that we have possessions, possessions which a Christian may not have, possessions which directly contradict our profession of the Christian faith, we must put them into no other category than those things which are to be destroyed. Uh, we are to part with them completely and entirely so that neither we nor anybody else will be sinfully influenced by them. And in so doing, we will be following the good example that these believers in Ephesus did who burned their books of curious arts. Now, this passage that we read from Acts chapter 19, the context is that Paul is on his third missionary journey. And the focus of his labors would be in the city of Ephesus. And here in the city of Ephesus, great attention would be called to the preaching of the gospel by the miracles that Paul was given the power to perform miracles. We read about those earlier in the chapter. Paul would touch a handkerchief or some apron, and that piece of clothing was given to somebody who was sick, given to somebody who was possessed with the Spirit, and by the power of God, of course, that person was delivered from his or her ailment or from the power of whichever devil was influencing him. Well, we read of two in this chapter that even greater attention was called to the preaching of the gospel when certain Jews decided that they would try and perform miracles as well. Now we read about these Jews uh, earlier in verse 13. Verse 13 here in Acts 19 calls them exorcists. They were a band of seven brothers and they set themselves forth uh, as those who were able to cast out evil spirits. And we read that these exorcists, they tried to cast out this devil. And the consequence was that they were exposed as powerless to do so. Uh, even though they tried to cast out the devil in the name of Jesus, they used the name of Jesus. But it doesn't matter if you use the name Jesus. 
We're reminded of that other text of the Bible, those who say, Lord, Lord, shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Even though these men use the name of Jesus, the problem was that they were revealed as, as not having the authority to do so. And that evil spirit said to them, uh, who are you? We know Jesus. We know Paul. But we have absolutely no idea who you are. And that man we read in whom the evil spirit was leaped on those seven men and uh, <clears throat> overcame them and prevailed upon them so that they fled that, that house bruised and naked. Now, it was when the, the, the people in Ephesus saw that these seven brothers who used the name of Jesus, but when these seven brothers could not cast out devils, but that Paul could. I say it was after they saw that those seven brothers could, but Paul could, that now, after seeing those types of miracles, these Ephesians brought their books of curious arts together and they burned those books. Now, if any of you are waiting for such a startling evidence of the truth of the gospel, you will have to keep waiting because God no longer works as he did during the time of the apostles by, by performing miracles by a certain person touching a, a handkerchief or touching some article of clothing. God no longer works the way of casting out evil spirits in the manner of which we read here in Acts chapter 19. Because with the eye of the body, we do not witness such evidences of the gospel as the Ephesians did. Because for us, New Testament Christians, the evidence of the truth of the gospel is found in the word itself. In the Bible, through the ordinary way, the, the, the scriptures, and then through the scriptures preached as well. That's where we see the power of the word. And so the calling to you and to me this morning on the basis of the Word of God is this, and we'll explain this in the course of the sermon, to burn your books of curious arts. And don't wait any longer, but do it now to show that you are a child of God and that you belong to Jesus Christ. And so we'll be hearing a sermon this morning from Acts 19, Verses 18 and 19 and 20. And the theme of the sermon is, very obviously when we read this text, we see burning the books. Let's see in the first place, what does that mean? Secondly, the reason. Why did these Ephesian Christians come together and burn their books? And finally, uh, how was it possible that they were able to do this? And so when we look at the text, the text before us really makes us marvel, does it not? It speaks of, of a strange and wonderful act that these uh, believers in Ephesus did. They burned their books of curious hearts. These books were books that were used in the practice of magic and in the service of idolatry because we know that uh, we know the history of Ephesus Ephesus was a city in the larger part of Asia Minor and there in Ephesus well in Ephesus was the temple to the great goddess Diana and people worshiped her in Ephesus and we also remember that incident with Demetrius, the silversmith. That's a little bit later in Acts chapter 19. We didn't read that far. But how Demetrius got together all of his fellow silversmiths because they were in jeopardy of losing their profession because if people no longer believed in Diana, then they would no longer be able to sell their idols of Diana. And, and, and they... They riled up the whole city so that for the space of two hours they shouted, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. 
Well, associated with the worship of Diana were many superstitious activities. There was the practice of magic. There was the study of astrology. There was fortune telling. There was the use of charms and all things associated with idolatry, perhaps uh, very similar things that you see happening here in Limerick, and especially I have in mind the Roman Catholic Church. But but all these ways uh, were were, were thing, all these were ways in which those who worship Diana try to discern her mind and her thoughts and. If you wanted something to help aid you in discerning the mind and thoughts of Diana, you could buy books, and the text refers to such books. Now what we mustn't overlook is that the text says that believers own these books. That verses 18 and 19, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And in verse 19, many of them also which used curious arts brought the books together and burned them. And that word them in verse 19 refers to those believers mentioned in verse 18. So don't imagine that it went this way, that Paul came into the city of Ephesus and he he preached the word and, and immediately people were converted and immediately they took their books of curious arts and they came and they burned them. That's not the sequence of events. Uh, but in verse 18, verse 18 teaches us that these people believed, which tells us that they probably had believed for quite some time already. In other words, there was a point in time before when they confessed uh, faith in Christianity and yet they kept their books of curious hearts. And not only that they, that they kept their books and that they had their books on the shelves just gathering dust, but verse 19 says they used Curious arts. Now how sad. How very sad. But how true to life. Because this would be like you and I. Not only confessing the truth of Jesus Christ on the one hand. And declaring that we are believers. But on the other hand. Owning books of astrology. And, and fortune telling. And not only that we would own those books, but that we would use those books as well. It would be like you or I claiming on the one hand to be believers, but on the other hand being willing and ready to listen to any idolatrous gospel in this world. And so it's sad, really, Sad because to own these books and to use them was a contradiction of the profession of their faith. Sad because it was a practical denial of Jehovah. They confessed Jehovah with their mouths, but in deeds they denied him. But it's a sort of sad thing to which you and I are prone as well. Now, the text says that, that at this point, when they saw the power of the gospel clearly displayed in the miracles that Paul performed, when the, when the people of Ephesus saw this, that they burned their books. And the text gives unto us a, a very vivid picture. It, it gives unto us the picture that the, these men and women are coming to some central square, to, to, to the public square in Ephesus, and they don't have just one book, they don't have just two books, but their arms are laden with books, and they, they come to the, the public 
square in Ephesus, and they throw their books down, and they put the wood on that pile, and behind the first person is another person with his arm full of books, and behind him another repeatedly, almost in droves, they are coming to burn their books. And by doing this, they are inflicting great loss upon themselves. Why? Because these books were of great value. Let's consider that for a little bit. Uh, notice with me that these were not books like we have books. We have hardcover books. We have soft cover books. These weren't the type of books that they had. These were papyrus scrolls. And there was no printing press in those days. Uh, but each one of their books that they had was painstakingly copied by a scribe. And perhaps it took a year, perhaps it took two years or even more for a scribe to copy just one book. And the point is that these Ephesian Christians, they couldn't replace these books. If we wanted to replace a book, well, we can destroy a book. And we can go on the internet, we can buy 50, we can buy 100, we can buy however many you want of the same book. We can go to the bookstore here in memory and buy however many we want. But that wasn't the case with these Ephesian Christians because these books that they had, their scrolls, their parchments were one of a kind. And yet what did they do with their books of curious arts? They burned their books. But notice in the second place that they didn't sell their books. That's quite interesting as well. There was a ready market in Ephesus. There were so many pagans who believed in Diana and in all of this magic and astrology. There was a ready market. They could have sold their books to somebody else saying, I don't use this book anymore. It doesn't serve in me anymore, but if you give me some of your money, maybe I'll just sell my book to you. No, they didn't sell their books, but they burned their books. And when they burned their books, they took the time to see how great a loss it was for them. And that's why the text says, uh, they counted the price of their books, and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, we ask, what, what is 50,000 pieces of silver worth in today's money? Well, some of the commentaries say that uh, the price would have at least been, uh, well, in euro, probably about five to 6,000 euro. But that was a commentator who wrote this book who, who said that about 100 years ago. <laughs> there, are, there was another commentator who said that this price must have at least come to what would be the equivalent of close to 1 million euro. Now, uh, however much 50,000 pieces of silver is, it is not the point. The point is that the Holy Spirit, by putting this value in Scripture, 50 thousand pieces of silver means to impress upon you and me that this was an enormous sum of money. And, uh, and yet what did they do? They burned their books. This was a great loss for these people. They sacrificed much for the sake of their confession of Jesus Christ. But notice too, that they lost more. For in burning their books, they not only lost the, the value of the book itself, but they lost the value of their investment. Because those who practiced magic, those who used curious arts, well, they did it for a fee. And they did it, and they charged others. Uh, and don't overlook the fact here that, that they lost so much more money it would be, well, they lost the value of their investment. It would be if a business owner was going out of business and instead of selling the business, 
he would burn the business down to the ground altogether. They lost the value of their investment. And so when we stop and we think about this, this is absolutely amazing. Would you, would I, inflict such loss upon ourselves uh, as readily as did these Ephesians? Burning 50,000 pieces of silver? Now, the books that you and I own would perhaps take a different form than the books that these Ephesian Christians had. These books that they had were papyrus scrolls. And the books that you and I own and that we would be tempted to hang on to would not necessarily be hardcover or softcover books. And the purpose in our having our books might be a little different than the purpose that these Ephesian Christians had their books. They, they had their books because they did business with them and they made money off of their books. We might own our own books and practice them for our own personal and private recreation. But the point of similarity is this. Any possession that you or I might have, or any practice in which we engage ourselves, anything that would be an instrument used in the service of idolatry, directly contradicting our Christian faith is a book that must be burned. And perhaps the books that we own, uh, I just name a few. There are so many con different kinds of books in our lives. Perhaps the books that we own would be the, the CDs, the music, the DVDs of this world or the magazines of this world. The books that we have could be the songs of the world. And the songs of this world sing the praises of the gods of this world and sing about sex and, and, and lusting and coveting. You cannot sing the songs of the world and sing the songs of Zion. The, those two don't go together. Perhaps the books that we would own would be the world's movies. And even God's people can become so enamored with the godlessness that we see in the movies of this day and age in which we live. And, and with Hollywood and with the, the glitz and the glamour of the silver screen. And if you take a DVD or a movie away from people, they become frustrated and angry because... Their lives revolve around it. And suddenly, it has become a God unto them. You cannot watch the movies of this world and engage in the culture of this world and call yourself a Christian. Perhaps the, the, the books that we own could be the magazines of this world. So many different types of magazines. Not only explicit pornographic material, of course that is sinful, but perhaps it's those supermarket uh, magazines and tabloids in which so many people thrive off of and get so much of their pleasure out of. They, they read these tabloids and, and they read, uh, do you want to increase your, your beauty? Well, follow these steps. You have to follow these 10 steps to improve your life and your life will be happy. You have to buy this magazine and suddenly your life will be changed. Well, you can't read the Bible and read the magazines of this world and say that the two go hand in hand because the magazine set forth the gods of this world whereas the Bible sets forth the truth about God. And so our calling is to examine ourselves, each and every one of us, and ask just what might it be in my life, in my home, in my closet, underneath my bed, anything 
that would fall under the category of a book of curious arts. And I say that we have to examine our lives because it's very easy for us to look at others and to say, oh yes, that person, they have so many books in their lives that they have to burn. We have to look at our own lives and examine what do we have that we must burn? What kind of practice, not just things, but what kind of practice have I readily engaged myself in which I have to stop, which is not good for a Christian to do. And we have to ask those difficult questions, and we have to ask, are you ready to burn the book? Are you ready to cease the practice? Are you ready to set aside your interest in the things of this world? Do you see that to own such a thing and to practice such an act is to directly contradict the faith that you confess. And perhaps you might say, well, pastor, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Yes, I have my books and I, I practice my books and I take pleasure out of my books, but, but I go to church as well. I, 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 I pray to God as well, and I, I read the Bible once every other day. I can do the same. I can still have my book because I do these other good things. Well, that would be kind of like uh, a son, while well, a father going to his son, and, and that son has just drank petrol out of the petrol container for the lawnmower, and the father says to his son, son, you may not drink petrol out of that container. And can you imagine if that son would say, but Father, yes, I drink this petrol, but on the other hand, I, I still drink water and I still drink milk. You see, the, the, the two don't go hand in hand. You cannot practice your book of curious arts and still confess your faith in Jehovah because they don't go together. Now notice what these Ephesian believers did with their books. They burned their books. They utterly destroyed their book. They ceased their practice so that neither they nor any others would be sinfully influenced by them. And that's our calling as well. We have to burn our books. It doesn't mean that we have to literally take a match and burn whatever type of possession we find that is very harmful for us, but it means that we have to get rid of it. It means that we have to destroy it. With regard to a certain practice in our lives, it means that we have to stop right now and never engage in that practice again. And so the question is, are you ready to burn your books. Are you ready to rid your lives of these wretched things? Its value does not matter. It does not matter how much money that book of yours would fetch if you were to sell it at the milk market. It does not matter how much your co-worker would give you for that book. Whatever its value, what, it doesn't matter what's, what your emotional or sentimental value to it might be. Whatever that book might be, the question is, are you ready to burn it? Are you ready to get rid of it utterly and entirely so that it no longer harms you or would sinfully influence somebody else? To do so would be to follow the example of these believers in Ephesus. But now we ask the question, why did they inflict such a great loss upon themselves? Did they have to do this? Were, were they compelled by Paul to come and, and to burn their books? Whereas in their hearts they say, well, I really don't want to do it, but I better just do it anyways. Well, the answer to that question is this. 
they now understood that they must completely devote themselves to God even in their outward lives. Complete and utter devotion. And these Ephesian believers in, from Acts 19, they see that they cannot have it both ways. It's either God or nothing. And so they burn their books. And by this, they are saying that to worship and to serve Jehovah alone requires us to make a complete break with the sins of the past. We will burn our books. They say that to worship and to serve Jehovah alone means that we must serve Jehovah consistently at all times, in all places, and we will burn the books, and that they will do that publicly, and that to worship and to serve Jehovah alone means to say that really there is no other option. It's not good enough that I simply sell my book or even give my book to somebody else and say, well, well, I can't use this book anymore in the service of my God, but here you go. You try and serve it in the worship of your God. No, not that. But to serve Jehovah alone is to say that, that there's no other option. And that all of this stuff in the world that proclaims the idolatry of the world it is useless and worthless and rubbish. And so, to demonstrate complete devotion to God, they burned their books. And this was as much of them saying, they were confessing here really, I will trust in Jehovah God to provide me with my welfare. I will give up the value of my business. I will give up all of this money that I could earn by way of these books of curious arts. All that doesn't matter because I trust Jehovah. I will give up my high standard of living if needs be because I know and I acknowledge that Jehovah God will take care of me and I will trust in Him alone. And all of this involved on the part of the Ephesian believers true repentance. Now, now this repentance of theirs comes out in the text. In verse 18, the Bible says, And many that believed came, and then this phrase, they confessed and showed their deeds. So they, they confessed. We saw from Bible study the other night what confess means. It means to say the same thing. But when you confess, you're, you're saying something with your mouth. It's something audible. And here, when it, the Bible says they confessed, it tells us that they repented in words. In words, they confessed their sins and they confess, we have not been consistent Christians. As a matter of fact, our claim to Christianity was just a veneer with which we covered ourselves, but we've done wrong because in our hearts there was idolatry. And so in their words, they confessed their sins and they repented. But notice too, in deeds, did they repent? They, they showed their deeds. Well, how did they show their repentance by their deeds? Obviously, they burned their books. And now, at least from an outward practical point of view, there is no good way for them to return to their idolatry. And so, the text before us teaches us lessons about true repentance. In the first place, true repentance means a complete break from sin and a complete turn to God. True repentance now with regard to the sin of the act. Because it's true that in all our lifelong, 
We're constantly repenting. We're constantly turning from sin and turning unto God and trusting in Him. But now, with regard to that blatant act of sin to which you and I are prone, we are to turn from that sin, and turning away from it and turning unto Jehovah God. And in the second place, we learn that when a gross public sin has been committed, the true repentance of an individual is public as well. Uh, notice that the nature of the sin, of this sin in the text, was public for the Ephesians. They owned these books of curious arts. They had a business of it. This was a, a public matter that all of the people knew of, and so they had, had to make a public confession of their sin. And they did so by not only confessing in words that they sinned, but also confessing in their deeds. And they burned their books. And verse 19 says, they burned their books before all men. Now that's quite something. Can you imagine those Ephesian believers who had a, 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 a pagan brother, a pagan sister, a, a father or a mother who was not a Christian standing on the sidewalk there in the central square of Ephesus and watching their loved one come with all of these books of curious arts, all of the, this money in their arms and throwing it into the fire and their father, their brother, their sister might have thought, what are they doing? But yet, those Ephesian Christians, they, they did this publicly. They were not ashamed to confess their faith before all men there in the central square of Ephesus. Uh, but finally, true repentance as well, we know is a gift of the grace of God. There is no other explanation for how these Ephesian Christians could do what they did. True repentance, it, it, it's not an, an intellectual activity in our hearts whereby we determine all by ourselves without the grace of God that we are going to turn from sin and turn unto God. But true repentance is a gift of the grace of of God. And so God works in our hearts to burn our books. And now finally, let's ask this question as well. How was this possible for them to do this? To burn their, not only to, to, to come to the realization that what these books that they had were not right for them to have, but then for them to go to the public square in Ephesus and to burn their books before all men. How was this possible for them? Well, this is possible, and it's possible for all of us because you have that power. You do. Because Jesus Christ lives in your heart and in mine. And so you have the power in your life to show complete and utter devotion unto God. And that's why I said in the introduction that when the child of God becomes convinced that he has some possession uh, or engages in some practice, that we must not wait for an opportune time to get rid of those things, but that we must make a complete break of those things now, and that we must put those things into the bin of those things that are to be destroyed and never to be seen again. Why? Because you and I have the power in Jesus Christ, who gives unto us His Holy Spirit, to rid our lives of all those books and to show complete devotion unto Him. Now, the text tells us about the power in which these Ephesian believers burned their books. This was 
the power of the Word of God. That comes out in verse 20. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Keep in mind the text has just, has just told us something wonderful and miraculous. These Ephesian Christians came, they had their books, they burned them before all men, and you might think that the next thing the Bible would say, well, would be to extol the, the, these Ephesian Christians for what they did. Might, you might expect that the Bible would say, wow, look at how much they sacrificed for the word of the gospel. But, but verse 20 really tells us, it gives us the explanation for it all. How is it possible that these Ephesian Christians were able to do this? And it says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And so what the focus is now, the focus is not on all the miracles that Paul did. It is true that God used those miracles as, uh, that Paul performed as an occasion to direct people to the preaching of the gospel. But the point never was in all those miracles that Paul was able to perform that the people simply look at the miracle itself and say, wow, what a wonderful thing. It's a miracle, I'm going to believe. Miracles always pointed to the Word. And right here, in verse 20 of Acts 19, the Bible says, so mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. That tells us the power in which these, these Ephesian Christians performed this act of theirs. They were demonstrating the power of the Word of God. And when the Bible says here that the Word of God grew and prevailed, then it means to say the Word of God, which has Christ at its very center. The Christ who forgives sins. The Christ who washes away all those sins in His shed blood. The Christ who sanctifies and preserves and glorifies. The, the Christ who died for his own sheep on the cross of Calvary. It means to say that it is Jesus Christ here who grew and prevailed. Not in his human nature, but insofar as Jesus Christ, by his word <clears throat> preached, and by the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of men to see how great he is, and the power of His grace, that Word of God grew and prevailed. And that's why we read of this instance of exorcism uh, earlier in the chapter. We talked about that already a little bit in the introduction. We see the, those seven sons of Sceva. They sought power. They wanted a reputation. But the fact of the matter was they, they had no power at all because... They lacked Jesus Christ. Uh, and they, they come to that man with the evil spirit, and that evil spirit says, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but who are ye? You see, they lacked the power. They could not prevail. They lacked Jesus Christ. And so the fact that these believers in Ephesus came and burned their books was evidence that the Word of God which is powerful in their hearts. The Word of God grew. But then, the Bible says here too that the Word of God grew and prevailed. That simply means that the Word of God is victorious. Uh, the Word of God is always victorious. There's nothing that can conquer the Word of God. Uh, and when we bring the Word of God to others, we don't try to perform miracles. We don't try to do anything. We simply bring the Word. The Word of God is mighty to prevail. And in this instance, the Word of God prevailed. Prevailed over what? It prevailed over rooting out every form of idolatry in the hearts of these Ephesian Christians and in our hearts as well. 
And so this is the power that the Word of God has today as well. Uh, I say once again, we do not look to miracles for power. Uh, that was the way that God operated during this time of the apostles. But once the canon was complete, that's all we need. The Word of God grows and prevails. And that Word of God has power yet today. That Word of God has such power. The Bible which we are privileged to have in our hands and to read, the Bible has the power to root out idolatry in your heart and in mine. And the Bible has that power uh, to root out idolatry so that we actually burn our books. And by the power of the Word of God working in your heart and in mine, others take note of us and they see that we are different. And perhaps they say unto us, but, but I thought this was your favorite type of book. I thought this was your favorite type of music. I thought this, these were the type of movies that you always like to watch. I thought this was what we always enjoyed hanging out at the pub for many hours into the late hours in the evening. I thought that's what you always like to do. You mean to tell me that you are completely and utterly devoted to your God? And we respond, yes, you've got it right. I've earned my books and I serve my God wholly with my whole Heart. And so, in other words, if we go home this morning from church, and if we say with regard to certain things that we own, or with regard to certain practices that we have, anything that we could be fall into the category of a book of curious arts, and if we go home, and if we say, well, I'm not going to burn my book, Perhaps I'll try not to take as much pleasure in my books as I have in the past, but, but I'm not going to burn my book. If that's your attitude, then you cannot blame the Word of God. And you cannot blame Jesus Christ for not making you do it. But you must admit that it is your own stubbornness. And at the heart, it is your own unbelief. It is, let us put it this way, it's really this. You do not love God as much as you say you do. But now finally, uh, in conclusion, what about the loss? These Ephesian Christians, they sacrificed so much for the sake of their confession of Jesus Christ. But what about the loss? The Bible says 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money. Uh, hundreds of euros. Perhaps you might say you've spent on your godless music. Hundreds of euros on your godless movies and DVDs. Uh, or whatever type of book you might have. Well, the word of God to you and me this morning is this. The power of Jesus Christ working in our hearts can give unto us treasures much greater than 50,000 pieces of silver. These are the types of treasures that far outweigh any monetary loss to your bank account. These are the treasures of grace. This is the treasure of the forgiveness of sins. This is the treasure of going to God in repentance and receiving grace from God and experiencing that grace and going forth in your life and saying, it doesn't matter what my earthly circumstances in life are, I am a child of God and I trust in Him. And what a great treasure that is to have that knowledge and to have that confidence and to know that when I die, my Savior will come and He will embrace me 
He will take me to heaven. I'm simply a sojourner here. My life on this earth is only for a short while, and soon my Savior comes. I say the knowledge of that is such a great treasure. Treasure that is so much greater than 50,000 pieces of silver in your bank account or mine. And so the word of God is this. Burn the books in your lives. Suffer the loss if need be, but do so with your eye upon Jehovah and upon the riches and upon the treasures that Jesus earned for us on the cross of Calvary, and so mightily will the Word of God prevail in your life and in mine. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for all the treasures of salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Treasures unspeakable. Treasures that we experience now in this life the treasures that we will experience into all eternity as well. Father, work in our hearts by the power of thy Holy Spirit so that we turn from all our sin, so that we burn our books of curious hearts, and that in that way we show that we are devoted unto our Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Father, and bless us in the rest of this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.